Okay. And yeah, we see, how long, see how long I can go and all that. Still work yeah. on. I meant to be more ahead in the project I was telling you about by this time, too. Ah. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry about that. I mean, sorry. so this one, we do not know how long or short it's going to be, but or even how much of a help it is going to be. Um, Charles here is, um, I can call you by your name, right? Charles. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> all right. So Charles here is a bit newer to Marxist. If I understand correctly, he's a Marxist Leninist Maoist. Yes. Um, so he is from what he's told me so far, he's pretty new to Maoism and doesn't really know all that much about about it. He is a former anarchist. Um, I am still an anarchist, and I highly doubt that my views are going to convert because I have some really heavily individualistic and the um, anti-authoritarian tendencies. But I thought it would be nice to discuss this and get at least somewhat more of like a united front on this issue. And so I felt having someone to come on and talk about Marxism, Leninism on my channel would be a good idea. So, um, let, let's try and start with the basic with, yeah, I, I know, um, it's, I mean, with philosophy, it's kind of hard to start with the basics, but, um, <clears throat> what exactly brought you to Maoism? Um, I think like a lot of people, it usually has to do with like a YouTuber or something they came across online that gets them to really look into a different point of view. Mine was seeing a new channel called The Black Red Guard. There's a black man around St. Louis area who's a Maoist and creates Maoist content. But ah. also it's like a, other things I've been thinking about, like I, on my last degree I was working on, for college, I was going to major in philosophy, but then I decided to switch to computer science to hopefully make money. <laughs> but when I was studying philosophy, hopefully. I had studied quite a bit of Marx too. So, and I considered myself a materialist, so I was always trying to square some circles with anarchism's more idealistic tendencies. Yeah. Well, I mean, I am. I mean. I, I don't talk about it very much, but I myself am a postmodernist. So, I mean, I, I've found that I am trying to um, – postmodernism, I would say, is very highly against the idea of ideals. But I would argue that idealism isn't necessarily um, – I mean, at least for the praxis of anarchism, it's not necessary for – Anarchism, and I mean, anarchism itself is very diverse. Uh, but I mean, I know what you mean, where when you're not an idealist, you're trying to, like, some of the ideas can seem a bit more idealistic, and uh, right. I can see what you're talking about, trying to square some circles there. Well, basically, like, when I'm talking about materialism, it's like a starting point for reasoning. Like, I assume that the material world takes primacy over ideas yeah so like you know idealism in some way is pretty close to someone who believes in god you don't necessarily have to but basically you believe that like ideas and whatnot would take primacy over reality and that in some way yeah. ideas can shape matter more than the other way around or material forces all that Well, I mean, it seems like we have a bit of an interesting common ground here on the whole um, materialism thing, as I myself tend to be less concerned with the ideas of anarchism. I mean, I do think ideas can somewhat shape and reinforce material conditions, but I don't think they take supremacy over the, materi over the material conditions and your focus mostly has to be on changing material conditions. Um, 
and the material conditions will affect the ideas more than the ideas will affect the conditions. I mean, so this is a pretty interesting start. I mean, um, I've seen a few videos from Maoists um, over the last couple of years, and I mean, never, I, I don't think that Maoism would mesh well with, I mean, arguably, I would say my personality is probably the biggest barrier to me becoming a Maoist. But if I understand correctly, um, a lot of um, Marxist ideologies have a lot of basis in um, trying to be more pragmatic as opposed to try, as opposed to pushing for things as fast as possible. Trying to not necessarily work within all systems, but to try and basically serve as like a middle ground between go between doing like a stateless transition into communism and just staying in capitalism, preventing any amount of change to the capitalist system that would question capitalism's legitimacy. I mean, would you say that's correct or no? Um, not exactly sure what you're trying to say, honestly. Maybe I'm not sure what I'm trying to say. Um, I, right. I don't know how to explain it, but I mean, would you consider yourself a bit, would you consider, yeah, I, I don't know whether to call it like idealism, the idea that you have a more stateless society as soon as possible. Um, you try and address the system I, I, it, it's very hard to explain because I'm basically trying to sum up the commonalities of all different anarchist philosophies, which is a really difficult thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but I mean, I'm also excluding um, anarcho-capitalism and anarcho-primitivism because, well, those can fuck right on off. Uh, yeah. But would you consider yourself to be more pragmatic? Yeah, sort of. I hate the way that pragmatism is often used in political discourse around here because usually that just means vote for the Democrats because the Republicans are just a bit worse. And that's why people tend <laughs> to use pragmatism. But I don't see that as pragmatic when you're a I, communist and just... want communism because that's not going to get you to communism. I mean, may, voting for labor, maybe. Um, like that, That's a big maybe for me to vote labor, but Democrat, I, I really don't have the time to vote Democrat. I'd rather vote a third party I don't completely agree with just because they're better than the Democratic Party because basically our options with the Democratic and Republican Party are neoliberalism and neo-fascism. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's... Here are your two right-wing ideologies. Pick one. We're still going to keep capitalism. We're still not going to give a fuck about people. Pick one. Yeah, I mean, I, I know, though, that... Um, but, I mean, a lot of... Um, I mean, Marxist-Leninists um, that I've met, most of them agree with the idea that um, a state should eventually be gone anyway, but they think that the transition from socialism... That, like the transition from socialism to communism should have a state because to basically prevent the bourgeoisie from coming back and taking over again. Right. To prevent a counter revolution, because if you're going to have a revolution, you're overthrowing one class and that yes. class is going to want to be back in power. So you have to prevent that. And that's why I see, that's why I came to see the state as a, necessity for a time being for a transition to basically yeah. wield power and suppress the class we just overthrew because that's what every class that's what um every state does and marxists know that as well as anarchists is just that we see it using that tool to get us there because yeah. when you well, even when you look back at like catalonia stuff like that yep. you were crushed uh, they, uh, 
yeah. unfortunately weren't quite strong enough to prevent a counter revolution. Or in this well, case, I mean, so much a counter revolution, yeah. but the fascist creep kind of just came over and crushed them. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, about the Catalonia thing, I mean, I, I think it's kind of interesting as a couple of my, um, Marxist Leninist friend, mm-hmm. Leninist friends would agree that basically Catalonia was just so small in general that even under a Marxist Leninist government, you may have had a hard time actually, you, you may have still fallen into fascism just because you were surrounded <clears throat> by fascists. Well, yeah, and because there was, were still was, Marxist Leninists in Spain too. That was what the Republican forces were in. They also lost. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's just, there, there just wasn't enough. There, there just was not enough power there. I mean, I'm assuming that you as a former anarchist would know that like, not like, not like anarchism isn't necessarily saying that like we should just abolish everything overnight but like ba- basically the idea is that we basically disagree with or we disagree on how to transition from at least from what i know <clears throat> you could correct me if i'm wrong there i mean i, I would i, I mean, think i don't think that has to do with oh, how how people are defining a state like the way i see it if you're an anarchist and you're talking about having like a group of armed workers overthrowing the ruling class and then suppressing them when you're talking about suppressing them they're acting as a state so we might even consider things that a lot of anarchists have done creating a small worker state because yeah, I have taking the task of suppressing the bourgeoisie. I mean, I have, I have heard that from um, one of my other friends who's a Marxist Leninist. Um, I'm not going to say his name because he is anonymous. So that, that's why you're going to hear me refer to him as my friend, as opposed to like giving him like a Facebook name or anything like that. Even, even his Facebook name isn't his real name though. Um, but right. Yeah. I don't, I don't need his name. So <laughs> that's fine. But yeah, I mean the, uh, but yeah, I was going to say that it seems like there are, di- I mean, I wouldn't agree with the Marxist Leninist definition of a state, but I mean, if that was how you were defining a state, I mean, I would say that, yeah, I, I would say that a worker's state or a state that's offered that um, operates a bit more horizontally, um, that's taking the act of um, suppressing the bourgeoisie, I think that's a good thing to do. I think the bourgeoisie should be suppressed, um, that after a revolution, they're going to want to take that power back. And right. That, I mean, not only do I think they should be physically suppressed, I think their idea I, I think even their ideas should be suppressed. It's kind yeah, of because like, look at what happened after Nazi Germany and the reason why we didn't have an uprising of the alt right sooner was because so many governments um, outright made it illegal to have Nazi, to be in possession of Nazi propaganda. You literally got arrested if you had Nazi propaganda. This was finished and they took it out with force. It's an ideology that shouldn't be allowed to fester. It shouldn't be played with, shouldn't be dealt with. The only way you should ever deal with it is in snuffing it out. Right. And I mean, I would argue that capitalism, you'd have to largely do the same. You'd have to prevent, you'd have to <laughs> prevent people who were privileged in society before from spreading the idea that they're somehow now oppressed because they're no longer the ones who are in power and they're forced to live on equal footing with everybody else. They already try to push that narrative <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. yeah. The, the poor mean, rich people it, are it, oppressed and whatnot that's why what makes me worry about 
say like uh, hate speech laws or something like that in this country is what we see in like um, Louisiana where they had like the was it Blue Lives Matter bill or whatever where it's like a hate crime to resist arrest or attack a cop and they turn cops into a protected class and they could do the same exact thing with the rich where then all of a sudden if we have hate speech laws to protect say black folks or trans people then uh, eventually the rich or someone else will also claim that for themselves in a liberal state which means we kind of fashioned a rod for our own back I guess yeah. So I'm wary about it. Like, I want there to be consequences for hate speech and all that, but I think it's going to be up to us rather than the state until we had a different state. I mean, the state that we have now basically wants to suppress revolutionary action. They want to suppress people who are marginalized. They want to further marginalize people. It's a hate speech. It's... It's a hate crime to punch Richard Spencer in the face, but it's not a hate crime for a Nazi to stab an anti-fascist protester. You know, it's kind of, it's, I mean, that's a problem with hate speech laws in the modern state, especially since the whole job that police serve is to suppress the, it, it's to suppress the working class for the bourgeoisie even though they may not be bourgeoisie themselves, they are basically serving the purpose of the bourgeoisie and they're class traders, essentially. They're holding the bourgeoisie down and it generally just isn't... I, I don't know how to put it. it. The point is that essentially um, you can get hate speech laws that are perverted to be that um, <laughs> these hate speech laws get perverted to the point where it is the marginalized who are the victims of hate, of hate speech. Um, and that is um, it, that, that is the big issue with hate speech laws. But, I mean, I am definitely sympathetic to the cause of um, trying to keep fascists suppressed, trying to keep the bourgeoisie suppressed, trying to keep... Like, these are ideas that, um, if allowed to fester and not properly combated, they will completely destroy any work that anarchists or... Marxists, Marxist-Leninists, anybody. The, the work that leftists have done, like if leftists do work and they successfully overthrow the capitalist system, if you, allow the, if you allow capitalism to fester, if you allow people to, if you allow the rich people to go, well, now I'm oppressed because I, I'm no longer in power when really they're just on equal footing with everybody else. Um, if they can do it convincingly enough, it unfortunately seems to fool a lot of people. Um, a lot of people react to things emotionally. I mean, that's part, that's the whole idea behind propaganda is that you want to play into someone's emotions. This can be, this can be done to benefit society or it can be done to detriment society. So it can be done for the purpose of, um, for basically for the purpose of keeping the status quo in place. Um, using scapegoats, for example, is an example of propaganda being used to suppress the marginalized. Um, right. it, um, this is a very common tactic. It is... It's a very common propaganda tactic because it's effective. Um, it's the reason why scapegoating is very common. We saw it in our um, presidential election, and while, and basically, while the Republicans claim that everything coming from people against Donald Trump is propaganda, um, 
of course, they're using propaganda in the liberal sense, which is um, anything that is demonstrably false. If it's propaganda, it's demonstrably false. It's fake news. Right. <laughs> when really propaganda, um, in the word, um, I don't know the exact quote from Chomsky, but I know basically the idea was the uh, the idea behind prop or, oh sorry I, I completely mixed up two topics in my head sometimes that happens mm -hmm. um, basically Chomsky's quote or what Chomsky said about um, propaganda was he said back before the liberal definition of propaganda came around everybody did propaganda and everybody was open about the fact that they were doing propaganda. But as soon as liberals changed the meaning, nobody wanted to admit that they were doing propaganda. Nobody wants to be called a propagandist anymore. Where before saying, Hey, I'm making arguments that are meant to basically convince people that I'm right. I mean, Sure, it's kind of a dirty tactic, but I mean, I would argue that um, while punching someone in the balls is a dirty tactic in a fight, um, if the if the problem is that you'll or if the risk is that you'll get stabbed if you don't, why not do it? I mean, if if you're going to be stabbed to death if you don't do it, if all your work is going to be completely destroyed if you don't do it do it. You need to protect yourself. You need to defend yourself. And I mean, that's basically the whole idea of propaganda is that um, communism would be quelled if people did not under it. I mean, sometimes you have to appeal to people's emotions. You don't have to do that for everybody as you can make non-moral arguments and you can address the failures of capitalism and stuff like that. But I don't think that propaganda is something that should be shied away from. You right. should use whatever means necessary to basically suppress it, it, suppress the people who want to see you destroyed. I mean, these, yeah, I think it, I think it goes kind of to Aristotle's idea of like the three proofs and rhetoric. You need pathos, logos, and uh, ethos. Like the pathos is the emotion part. You don't want to rely on just one of any of them. You want to use all of them. You want like facts to back it up. You need your credibility and the emotional angle. And all those yeah. can contribute to a persuasive rhetoric. <clears throat> yes. That's and propaganda is pretty much any media basically that's trying to persuade someone of something. Yeah. And it often leaves the other side out. Yeah. I mean, which is uh, fine because not everything is a debate. You know, if you're making like a art and you want to say you want to make a poster, a traditional kind of propaganda poster, you're not going to like put some stuff that makes communism look great or uh, heroic or whatever, and then the other side of capitalists yeah. or something, you know? Yeah, you're not going to do like a teach the controversy kind of poster of capitalism yeah. versus <laughs> communism. Everybody you already hears the capitalist side. Everybody's already heard yeah. all of it. So the capitalists do propaganda, and so do the communists. That's kind of the whole point: is that you want to convince people one way or another. I, I proudly admit that a good amount of my videos are propaganda, but at the same time, I mean, I do have liberals on to discuss stuff. I have, um, I mean, I I'm willing to engage with other people within reason right i mean i'm not gonna just decide okay only people who can come on my channel are anarchists yeah I mean, you're not gonna get anywhere if you don't i mean i also have a hangout with steve shives tomorrow I've, yeah. because i think he's genuinely a nice guy and it's something i i think that this can also be part of like it i mean i do think that outreach can be a good tactic where if you show solidarity with people mm -hmm. 100% with your opinion like in this case with liberals they still seem to like capitalism but they're in favor of social justice 
reaching out to the to people like Steve Shives might take a crowd that is mostly liberal and make them sympathetic to communism, sympathetic to anarchism and socialism and whatnot. You're gonna you'll I, I do think that this is an effective tactic if there's if there's a reasonable amount of common ground to actually try and like um, MLMs and anarchists are both communists, whether we both like to admit it or not. Um, we, we both believe in communism, um, but we have different tactics and we have different ways of looking at it. So there's common, there's, enough of a common ground that we can have solidarity in each other. Right. And I mean, liberals, there's a little bit less of a common ground, but I mean, at least with the social justice movements and the, like, the anti-racist, anti-misogynist um, action activism, um, those are people who I would argue are very prime, they're more likely to be sympathetic to the idea of capitalism because they're arguably just one thing, one question away from becoming communists. I mean, right. Yeah. I think uh, it makes them more consistent in a way. Cause if you're like, like there's that joke about liberal feminists and talking about say building a prison or something and liberal feminists are just like, well, I own more, female guards and it's like well if your goal is women's liberation why do you want some women oppressing others i'm sure that like if the, you I'm want sure more that, women in a boardroom or as ceos how is that helping all women be liberated it isn't uh, i'm it's sure just that giving um, some women, women a better be place uh, I'm, I'm sure that the black women will be glad that it's another black woman who's um putting them in handcuffs for activism right. i mean that um, identity politics on its own doesn't help things, but I mean intersectionality, which is derived by which is derived from identity politics, I would argue is a very good help as it um, adds um, as it's very easy to insert the class struggle into intersectionality, um, and I would argue that people who already see different oppressions as intersecting with each other are more likely to maybe question capitalism and question the ethics of capitalism, whether it's ethical to have this system with people on top. I find it funny. I discussed, or I named this hangout discussing Marxism, Leninism, and it just turned into a complete, we just started talking about communism and I kind of took the reins a bit. I mean, do you have anything that you would like to add about it? Because I feel like I've kind of talked over you a bit. Um, what was I going to say? I remember. I don't know. We both got kind of sidetracked. <laughs> I mean, you can kind of say anything about anything. I mean, usually the topic discussed is kind of like it almost always in my hangouts kind of leads to more discussion of other topics. So, I mean, it's fine if you don't have anything more to say about um, Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. Uh, right. but, well, um, I think I... Uh, Felina 26 said, more women dictators. Yeah. I think with... The, we, we need more of them. Yeah. It, it, the Syrians are proud to be bombed because it's a woman doing it this time. Oh, yeah, I saw a meme kind of like that. Yeah. Yeah, and Hillary, the it, same it, day it, that uh, Trump was bombing them, said, yeah, we should be bombing them. <laughs> there was no disagreement there. So, un unfortunately, what, um, I mean, most of the liberals I've met in day-to-day -day life would actually disagree with Hillary's stance on the Democratic Party stance, which actually makes me question how easy it is to convince liberals of communism and of class struggle. Yeah, I, I think, think they, that 
I think it would help to have a real identifiable movement too that's doing positive things. And I think that's part of what Maoism uh, can help with it as a more clear defined like anarchists do a lot of this work too. And most Maoists pep- wouldn't deny that anarchists do a lot of that work. And it's one of the things I liked about the Black Red Garden helped me um kind of transition from anarchism to Marxism, Leninism, Maoism is the way he talks about it. You know, in the oh, end he'll like he, he criticizes anarchism, but then he'll also say, I trust anarchists to have my back way more than like say Trotskyists or any liberal or anything. Yep. Like well, well, fuck the trots. That, that, that's the one thing that Marxists, Leninists and anarchists have always agreed on. Um, so butterfly, I saw what you said. You, it's not anarchists discussed it, discussing um, this guy. Charles here is a former anarchist who hasn't changed his picture yet. He is a Marxist, Leninist, Maoist, and he's a bit newer to it. I unfortunately thought that um, he might be a little bit like he might know a little bit more about it, but I mean, it, it's fine. I kind of want to get the Marxist Leninist opinion. And if you guys ever want to come on to my channel at some time to discuss it, I mean, I'd be glad to have you on my channel. Um, yeah, there were a couple of people um, in this, in, they're in a couple of groups that I'm in. Um, yeah, there are in a couple of groups that I'm in. Um, I, I've joined a couple of groups that have Marxist Leninists in them. I am interested, unfortunately. I haven't had much time to actually talk on like Discord and Skype and Google Hangouts because I've been really busy the past few weeks. This isn't like my normal schedule. But, yeah, I've been trying to reach out more to Marxist Leninists, as I believe, at least somewhat in a united front. Um, Damn, we're up to 11 viewers. This is more than normal. Hello to everybody watching. But, yeah, I mean seem to be more able to be molded than like the Democratic Party. You would expect the Democratic Party to be hardline, but uh, it, it was a joke. I, I don't actually hate all trots. I just really wanted to make a joke about trots. It, it's a <laughs> joke that I had with my friend on Facebook. But yeah. Um, yeah, ideologically, like no other communist really seems to like Trotskyists. I mean, um, I mean, I've talked to some trots. There are some trots who are like, my problem with a lot of trots is that um, I've seen way too many trots um, basically take the position of like defending American imperialism, which is something that I just, can't stand it. No, no, no. I, I mean, <laughs> I, I get mad at liberals for defending this shit. You're supposed to be a Marxist, and you're defending American imperialism. I, I know right. that it's not all is that's not like a key part of their ideology, but it, it's one of those things. Like it's a common theme, even if the majority of trots aren't like that. It's just like a common theme and it's like what everybody thinks of when you bring up trots very skeptical of trots uh, I know some commies who would like uh, who like to like Trotskyism from afar but wouldn't call themselves trots yeah I know some too um I mean, I even know a couple of trots who don't defend American imperialism. But, like, if you defend American imperialism, regardless of who you are, I really don't like you. It's <laughs> why I can't tolerate conservatives and why I have a big problem with a good amount of liberals, although some liberals can be convinced that it's wrong, especially the more social justice-type liberals. Right. And I think a large part of that is getting people to understand kind of I why it happens. And not only that, but that their lives, I their think lifestyle I already, 
the standard of living are better because of third world workers that we oppress through our imperialism or oppress through our imperialism. Yeah. Yeah. At this point, we're starting to get um, third worldists to. Um, that at this point, we are trying to get. Um, or at this point, we've now got third world. Um, we've basically got third world uh, workers or workers in the expo I, I call them exploited countries instead of third world countries. But um, we have these workers from exploited countries. Or the reason why there's uh, why work conditions are better here or because work conditions are better here and companies still want to make as much of a profit as they can, a lot of them will go overseas and they'll exploit the labor of the proletariat in places where there aren't as many regulations on work. Um, right. You know, um, communists definitely made improvements here in America. Um, like there, there is no doubt about it. We definitely made a lot of improvements on workers' conditions here. But I mean, it. I mean, the workers' movements need to win in exploited countries. Like they need to get at least some amount of victories, or it's not going to end well for them. Right, and so, that's I mean, why I think. I, think, think, uh, support, uh, I then, think we should support them as much as possible. Like, yeah, one important task, especially seen against uh, most Marxist Leninist Maoists and a lot of Marxist Leninists, is that we need to our primary task here in the first world is to combat imperialism, to fight our government from doing imperialism in different ways. And uh, because we don't believe a revolution is going to happen here until one happens in the third world and we can no longer have a better standard of living off the backs of third world workers. And then yeah. our standard of living will be more directly related to our own material conditions in this country, which will make a revolution here a lot more likely. I mean, I do think third world revolution could help um, have a revolution here. I do think it could make it easier, but I don't think it's solely, I don't think it's impossible here necessarily just because of third world exploitation i think that there are other aspects here in america that would make revolution really difficult to the point where it's nearly impossible like there's other like we definitely have to address the education question for example um we tend not to think about like or a lot of people we tend not to question what school teaches us but the thing is, is that school teaches us capitalism. It doesn't, it, it is very specific. Um, I mean, our education is kind of fucked. Uh, we, it, it kind of fucks any chance of class consciousness because we say, well, communism failed in the USSR. Because, you know, there's no other possible issue. There's no mistakes that Stalin may have had that weren't related to communism that might have um, made people... Also, not to mention that the, it wasn't even Stalin who destroyed the USSR, it was, or who ended the USSR. It was um, the people who came after him who basically decided, well, you know... We, we want to have um, talk. We want to have peace with America, which I mean, I don't. I mean, yeah, I don't oppose. I, I don't oppose of... peace in all cases. Like I don't oppose peace a lot of the time, but I mean, basically, these people were like, "Well, we're, we're doing anything at this point to try and make." Pe I mean, th there were definitely reasons that I understand why they would keep people. Like what? Like why they want to keep people in East Berlin, for example? I mean, you could get um, free education in the USSR, and leaving there and going to another country, fleeing the USSR or fleeing USSR-controlled Germany, 
you now can take that free education you got and you may do it, be doing it for yourself because you want a higher wage. But, I mean, they couldn't necessarily match the wages that the Western world had. The Western world just had such a head start. Capitalism had such a head start in the world. It, yeah, it's unfortunate, but, I mean, true. So, I mean, they couldn't match some of the living conditions because, you know, they were just starting up. I mean... I have some things that I would be critical about the USSR about, but I'd want to make sure that I like do a bit more research on the USSR and get more of a grasp of what the USSR was actually like before doing my critiques. Like I'm pretty sure that like e even the CNT, there may be, there are quite a few things that I'd probably be able to critique about them, but I'd want to know the whole story that and not just through the lens of the bourgeois media and right. so i mean it's so like they're um with bourgeois media so i mean there's probably some things that you could criticize things could be better and i don't think Marxist Leninists are against um, criticizing um, Marxist Leninist leaders. No. Uh, Generally, they don't do it outside of our own circles, though, which I think gives well, people, some people an impression that we like, think they were all perfect, which just isn't true. <laughs> I mean, it kind of makes sense to not criticize them out of, outside of your own circle. Well, it's the biggest thing is like when you're talking to, say, like a liberal or anyone who's like an anti-communist about it if you like start talking about criticisms of leaders then that's all they want to talk about and that's all they want yeah. the conversation to be and that's all they'll ever talk about <laughs> yeah i mean to my family i just actually like it's like yes i'm an anarchist but i'm like the i'm going to act like the tankiest tanky who's ever tanked when it comes to like talking about stalin and stuff because i just because it's like I use the identifier communist, so like I, I'm not going to like give them any leverage over my views by saying, "Yeah, these people suck." Because it's like, well, if you didn't know that I wasn't a fan of these people already, you clearly don't know enough about my ideology to even be discussing, like, to even be trying to like discussing it in a way that we could be critical of it. You have to know what you're talking about before you can critique it. And so, like, if you're just trying to tell me how bad communism is um, and you don't know about anarcho-communism and you're trying to tell me how bad my ideology is, you clearly don't know. Like, you clearly haven't looked up anarchist philosophy and you haven't seen the difference between different communist philosophies. Yeah, most people probably haven't. <laughs> yeah hmm. well I'm hoping that I could get more on my channel in the future but I understand that you have some um, work for that you're doing for college and stuff so I, I think we'll leave the discussion off here because I, be, uh, I mean I thought that you might know more about it you definitely know a little bit more about it than me um but i mean yeah there's more i could uh, talk about it's just the conversation kind of yeah moved like a snake <laughs> slithering around back and forth and sideways because yeah. uh, i think there's certain things that appeal to anarchists that come from maoist ideology like the mass line method of leadership which is kind of like a the party sends out cadres to all the people trying to go all the, well, in China, it's all the villages and stuff, but things are different nowadays, of course. But it'd be a similar idea, like say in here in America, sending uh, cadres to neighborhoods that are having a real hard time and trying to figure out what the people need and then trying to meet their needs. And I think that kind of appeals to anarchists too. 
in a sense because it's it's like there's a, still a central party in this part, but they're trying to reach out to the people and get input from the people, which is like kind of a more democratic way of doing things. Yeah. And then the other I mean, part I'm is I'm also, I'm a veteran. I was in the Marine Corps for eight years. So they also have a strategy, a military strategy in Marxism, Leninism, Maoism that makes a lot of sense to me. It's for just protracted people's war, which kind of feeds off the mass line for one, because you want, basically what you want to do is have your military contingent reaching out to a lot of people so that the people know that they're there for them. And you always have the people on your side, which is automatically going to make it way worse for any enemy you're going to fight. And then they also combine that with basically guerrilla warfare tactics and makes it nearly an impossible strategy to beat. Like you look in uh, Vietnam and that's kind of a lot of what was going on. And that's why America was never going to win the Vietnam War. Yeah. I mean, America shouldn't have even gone into Vietnam in the first place. I mean, like, I definitely want to leave with this one point. Like, I want, I want to kind of end it on, uh, joke, jokingly, I'm going to call it a cliffhanger. If communism was such a bad idea um, and capitalism was such a good idea, then why did you need to fight a war with an ideology that wouldn't spread if it was inherently a bad idea? Why did you need to fight the Vietnam War and why did you need to fight the Korean War? If they were worried it was going to spread because Vietnam and Korea decided um, that it might be a good idea to try a different system, why? Th that's a question that I have for conservatives who will probably never stop um, stumble across this video, so it's probably going to be a bit of an echo chamber, but, you know... Um, I have some stuff that I need to do, so I mean, I'm going right. to call this hangout. Um, thanks for the Marxist-Leninists who watched it, and I, I can see that the chat was flooded compared to my normal videos. I also saw that an, uh, that an actual joke um, has seen the video or has joined the hangout, so all right. I will have another hangout tomorrow. Um, see you all. <laughs> yes. Yes. In quotations, cliffhanger. Cliffhanger probably wasn't the best word for it. You know, what, what's, what's the answer that conservatives have? I mean, I know I have my answer, which is why I referred to it as a cliffhanger, but I guess since I don't intend to ever answer it, it's not really a cliffhanger. So, all right. Thing you want it's to like say before you go? It's like a movie that sets up a sequel and then the production company never pays for the sequel to come out again. <laughs> All right. So, anything you'd like to say before I stop the broadcast? Um, no, I mean, we can do something like this again once we can better flesh out our ideas and present a better hangout, I think, rather than a. Yeah conversation that kind of meanders a lot yeah because while like it's true that i don't know much i could have said a lot more i think if yeah we had some more specific topics yeah i mean i'm kind of trying to start i probably yeah i, I probably should have waited to do this hangout for like a couple of weeks in the future um like when my schedule was better and i had talked to some of my ml friends more so that I could actually get some specific topics to discuss. Right. Well, and I, I mean, thought that someone on my friends list would definitely be very friendly. And um, I, I thought that someone on my friends list would be much friendlier of a person to talk to and would be a bit kinder about it. Yeah. Malice in general, I think are more friendly to anarchists and anarchism like we still disagree with anarchism of course on like mainly the state and like i said it's mostly about what we call the state in a lot of conversations it seems to me yeah but yeah all right so i'm going to end the broadcast now see you all later
All right. Take it easy.